Thank you very much. Uh, in our last session, we had all kinds of interesting things happening. We discovered that we needed to cast the Mac demon out of the PC we have up here. Or do I have that reversed? I guess I have that reversed. But I think we've got that squared away, so we should have everything going well for this session. Our guest speaker is a personal friend of mine, someone that I really care about, and I just want to say something very quickly about him. He mentioned the fact that I was sort of a sound person for the pre-trib conference a couple of years. But what he didn't tell you was the graciousness that he shared with me because I was a Poe Seminary student at the time and I didn't have the money to afford the $50 entrance fee to go to the pre-trib conference. I don't even remember how I showed up on the scene. But what he did was he said, look, if you can help me out with the sound and miking the speakers and such, he says, I'll let you come to the pre-trib conference anytime you want. And I said, you got a deal. And so for the next two or three years, I was able to come and do that and just had a blessed time. And uh, boy, it was real special getting, sit, getting to, to sit in, to, uh, at the right hand of the majesty on high because uh, whenever we did this, we had a table off to the side. So if you had this screen here, they had a table over here where we monitored all the sound and, and Dr. Ice sat there and I got to sit right next to him and it was just a great, great experience. Speaking of Dr. Ice, let me give you a little background information on him for those of you that weren't here in our last session. Uh, Dr. Ice is the executive director of the Pre-Trib Research Center located at the Calvary University campus where Dr. Ice currently serves as a full-time professor of theology. The center has its annual meetings in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. He co-founded the center in 1994 along with Dr. Tim LaHaye to research, teach, and defend the pre-tribulational rapture and related Bible prophecy doctrines. Dr. Ice has authored and co-authored over 30 books, written hundreds of articles, and is a frequent uh, conference speaker. He has also served as a pastor for 17 years. Dr. Ice has a BA from Howard Payne University, a THM from Dallas Theological Seminary, and a PhD from Tyndale Theological Seminary, and has done postdoctoral work at the University of Wales in the United Kingdom. Help me welcome Dr. Ice back to the podium, if you will. Come up, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully we can have everything go okay during this session. And uh, I brought my Ryrie Study Bible up here with me. Uh, that was autographed by Dr. Ryrie the month it came out. And uh, I told him when I got to heaven I'd have God autograph the other half. But... <laughs> and of course he's now with the Lord. And, uh, but mine is the original study Bible, not these revised study Bibles. And uh, he also used to talk about how he was afraid one day they would put his Bible in red letters. <laughs> he didn't like red letter editions because he said people think that those are more inspired than the rest of the Bible. All the Bible's inspired, even in Deuteronomy. So that's what we're going to be looking at today, and it's good to be here with you today, and uh, I'm sure Ann and Andy and their little girl, their big girl, uh, is having a nice trip over where all of this took place back in the day, and where Jesus is coming back to, literally. He's going to come back there and put his foot down <laughs> and change the topography and a few other things. But we were, were looking at the fact that uh, God laid out his plan for Israel in the book of Deuteronomy, and the fact that this is Israel's covenant with God, his contract, his constitution with them. And he said that certain, and he adds a prophetic element to it, and we're showing that the fact that he prophesied all of this for the same people group, Israel, uh, indicates that he is not going to change horses in midstream, that he is going to fulfill this for the church. This is why God has kept his chosen people around uh, for 4,000 years, 
and why they have an important role to play in the future. And we as Christians are uh, spreading the gospel during these last 2,000 years until Christ raptures us out of here so that he can finish the 70th week of Daniel, the seven, known as the seven-year tribulation, of which Revelation chapters 4 through 19 have a detailed <clears throat> explanation of. And we saw earlier in the previous section that in De Deuteronomy chapter 4, the first mention of that tribulation period is provided for us there. And don't forget, Deuteronomy was given to the nation of Israel before they had ever set one little pinky into the land of Israel. And so it's a prophetic book. 28% of the book of Deuteronomy, when it was written, was prophecy. Much of that's been fulfilled, but much awaits future fulfillment. And so I was showing various passages that talk about the different phases in Israel's history. And we ended last session with Deuteronomy 28:68 about how the Lord will bring you back to Egypt in ships by the way about which I spoke to you, and you will never see it again. And there you shall offer yourselves for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but there will be no buyer. And we pointed out that in uh, AD 70, uh, over 100, uh, 1, 1 1.1 million Jews were killed by the Romans when they uh, destroyed the temple. By the way, the first temple in 586 BC was destroyed on the 9th of Av, and the second temple uh, destroyed by the Romans on the 9th of Av, same exact day. And within the modern Jewish calendar, the ninth of Av is the saddest day of the year. And they walk around the city if they live in Jerusalem, and they are sad until the sun goes down, and then they celebrate because they're looking forward to the next temple that God's going to build. So it's interesting, you know, God is amazing how he does things like that, has both temples destroyed on the very same calendar day. And here he's talking about them being taken away in ships. And so 110,000 Jewish people were sold into slavery after AD 70 in Egypt on the slave market there. And this is a specific prophecy about this, uh, th uh, well, uh, one and a half thousand years before it actually happened. And so he, then, then we look at Deuteronomy 29.2. And Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord, has, uh, Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and all his servants and all his land. And of course, the miraculous deliverance from Egypt. The great trials which your eyes have seen, these great signs and wonders. And here we see signs and wonders often associated with uh, Christ or the Lord's visitation in history. We saw it during Christ's ministry as well. He says, yet to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to know, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. And he's telling them right up front uh, that they need a new heart. But the Lord has not given it to them yet. And this explains the reason for their disobedience. And you and I know, as primarily Gentile Christians here today, I assume, uh, that uh, we needed a new heart and a new mind when we became to Christ. Christ has to enable us to believe in that sense. And so uh, he's telling them that to this day, they have not been given that. Now, we're going to see where he tells them they will be given that in, in the future. And so this moves us into Deuteronomy chapter 30. And verse 1, which is a prophetic overview of the future for Israel. He says, so it will, shall be when all of these things have come upon you, the blessing and the cursing. Now, Deuteronomy 28 is the blessing and cursing section. There's like 12 verses of blessing, and there's, 60, there's like five times more verses on cursing. And uh, so that's not very positive, but nevertheless, that's realistic. And so that's the blessing and cursing section that he's talking about. When all of these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind in the nations 
where the Lord your God has banished you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and soul, according to all that I command you today, you and your sons. So there's going to come a time in the future when the nation is going to be converted. By the way, we learn in Romans chapter 11, uh, verse 25, I believe, that all Israel will be saved. And after two-thirds of the Jews who will be purged out during the seven-year tribulation, we learn that from Zechariah chapter 13, verses 8 and 9, that the one-third that are going to be left, every one of them is going to be converted to Jesus as their Savior by the second coming. And so God has a plan for the Jewish people. And then we see, as you read passages that talk about the millennium, every Jewish person during the thousand-year millennium is going to be a believer as well. And so God, it, it says God will, be, will make it up to them for the lean years. And, of course, there will be chill, those who are alive at the second coming will go into the millennium in their mortal bodies and continue to have children, etc., <clears throat> and live for a thousand years. And so those that are born uh, to Jewish parents will all become believers, the scripture indicates. And so this is what he's saying. And he goes on and says, then the Lord your God will restore you from captivity and have compassion on you and will gather you again from all the peoples, the nations, where the Lord your God has scattered you. Now we see this talked about in Matthew chapter 24, See, what, what is that verse? Around 31 or so, he talks about how he will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. If you look at the term the elect, it's used three times in Matthew 24. Every time it refers to Jewish believers. And so st- instead of taking LL airlines to Israel, as they do today, the Lord is going to send angels. It's a quote out of Deuteronomy, by the way. Uh, And they're going to physically bring all the Jewish people who are not in Israel at the second coming uh, back to the land. And so that's what he's talking about. He'll gather you again. And this verse is referenced in Matthew 24 from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are at the ends of the earth, from there the Lord your God will gather you. And from there he will bring you back. And even... The Jews, uh, many of the Jews will be in Petra uh, during the second half of the tribulation on the other side in Jordan. I don't, I, I don't know if Andy's going to Petra this time or not, but uh, it's an interesting place. And so we see that there are five stages of this covenantal curse that are talked about in Leviticus 26 when they were in the land. And the first stage was that they would have experience emotional distress when, if they're not disobeying God. And at any point, they can repent and uh, God will give them the promise of restoration. That, that's the condition, repentancy. So if they, and this is repeated seven times, the, the book of Judges uh, reflects this very uh, process here in the book of Judges. Uh, You see, then drought is sent to the country uh, as far as their agriculture production. Seven times. If they don't repent, then they go to the next phase of dread where they're afraid of their enemies and stuff like that. Seven times as well. Then the next phase of the covenantal curses is diseases will come upon them. And Those are compounded. And then finally, the fifth phase is devastation and deportation, where they are kicked out of the land. But see, they're not just, it wasn't just God got mad at them and kicked them out of the land. There's this phase that they went through to, uh, he gave them every chance under the sun, and therefore they're kicked out of the land. And that's what we see happening in AD 75, AD 135. They're scattered among the nations. And uh, they were brought back in 586 B.C., uh, and then they're scattered around the world. And so this global dispersion is what they're in, and we're seeing a process today of a transition, part 
40 something percent of the Jews are now back in Israel, but a majority are still in the dispersion, you see. And so we're in a transition time when it comes to that issue uh, that he is in the process of regathering Jews. We see Leviticus 26, uh, this re restoration phase of this five stages of, of the, applying the curse to them. And verse 40 says, if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their forefathers in their unfaithfulness, which they committed against me, and also in their acting uh, with hostility against me, I also was acting with hostility against them to bring them into the land of their enemies. Or if their uncircumcised heart becomes humbled so that they then make amends for their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob. And I will remember also my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham as well and I will remember the land. So this is the Abrahamic covenant uh, that he will further implement. So this is the, as I told you last hour, this is the mother of all covenants and all of these other covenants, not talking about the uh, covenant where he made after the flood to not flood them and any of that kind of stuff. But the Abrahamic covenant is the salvific covenant from which even our own salvation flows because it promises blessing to the nations and we're included in that as well. And he goes on and says, for the land shall be abandoned by them and shall make up for the Sabbath while it's desolate without them. And so we saw the first uh, dispersion into uh, Babylon was because they had not kept the Sabbath. And the same is true, the land is going to lie fallow, which it has, and I talked last hour about how uh, the modern st uh, land of Israel before the Jews started coming back, uh, especially in the 1880s, uh, was a very uh, difficult place to live in because of the malaria and other diseases that were there, which kept it at a very low population base. And so, in fact, uh, a study has been done to show that almost all, almost, not always, not all of them, but almost all the Arabs that lived there uh, back in the 1980s had only been there one generation. You know, this is a fable that is being taught that the Arabs, you know, have lived in this land all this time. There were many Arabs, but even the last two to 300 years, uh, by far, many, the Jews were the dominant population in, in Jerusalem, for example because many European Jews, uh, when they got old, wanted to go back to the Holy Land, to Jerusalem, to die, so they could be buried in the Holy Land. So many European Jews would come, and that's why you had what was called the Israel Fund that was started uh, <clears throat> by the Rothschilds, <laughs> famous Rothschilds people, and uh, they were the bankers of Europe, Jewish bankers, and they had a fund, and just like uh, a lot of Sunday schools here in America will take, you know, quarters and dollars and things for the children during their little offerings and collect them and send them to the missionaries. Uh, the Jews at Sabbath time would send a collection for the last two to three hundred years to the Israel fund that was the Spitz. And that's what they used to buy the land primarily. They would pay six, seven, eight times more than it was worth to the absentee Arab land, order, land owners that tended to live in Cairo or uh, in uh, Damascus. And so uh, they bought this land <clears throat> starting in the 1880s through, from the, uh, through the Israel Fund, and many of them started coming back to settle it. And he says, the land shall be abandoned by them and shall make up for the Sabbaths while it is made desolate without them. They, meanwhile, shall be making amends for their iniquity because they rejected my ordinances and their soul abhorred my statutes. Yet in spite of this, <clears throat> when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them. You see that? The church has not replaced Israel. Israel's been set aside. Jewish believers are part of the church. As we've said, that's why you have to have the preacher of rapture so that God can finish the 70th week of Daniel. I did not reject them, nor will I so abhor them as to destroy them, breaking my covenant with them, for I am the Lord 
their God. And he says, but I will remember for them the covenant with, with, with their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God, I am the Lord. These are sovereign statements. He's going to do that. He's doing it in our own day in preparation for the 70th week of Daniel. And back to Deuteronomy, verse 5 says, And the Lord your God will bring you into the land, future, which your fathers possessed after they're sent out among the nations. Then he will bring them back to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. And I can't emphasize enough, this is before they ever went into the land. He's telling them prophetically what's going to happen. And he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Even more than under the prosperity of Solomon? Well, yes. Because it'll be fulfilled specifically during the millennium. More of the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. In other words, they're going to become regenerate. God will give them a new heart. He gave us a new heart when we became a believer and a, and a new mind. But the new covenant for Israel during the is going to be even greater than what we experience today uh, during the church age. And he will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all, in order that you may live. And so this is the whole point. Part of the purpose of Israel is to demonstrate because that you need a new heart to be able to, to please God, to keep God's commandments. Remember when the children of Israel were there and they were given the Mosaic law and, and he said, well, are you going to keep this? And they all said, yes, we'll keep it, we'll keep it, right? We're going to do it. So much of Israel's history has been a demonstration that they can't do it and they need the grace of God, you see. And so at the time of Christ, when he came, they had created uh, the Pharisaic Judaism where they built a wall around the 613 commandments of the Mosaic law so that they wouldn't get close, you know, like putting a fence around a swimming pool to keep somebody from falling in. And they focused on those 613 things rather than on the Mosaic law itself, you see. And you see Christ interacting with them in the Gospels. And by the time of Christ, they had built a second wall around. And he, Jesus interacts with their Pharisaic Judaism, which was focused not on the law itself, but on the man-made rules to keep you from falling into the swimming pool, so to speak. And uh, therefore, you hear him interacting with them, saying, you have heard it said, where he's quoting uh, these man-made rules, but I say unto you, you see, and so he's interacting with uh, them in the Gospels. And because they didn't focus on the actual word of God, then their hard hearts had rejected him. Even though we know from history, 30% roughly of Jews accepted Christ as their Messiah in the first century. And if you remember, the early church was 100% Jewish for a good while. And then Gentiles start being added. The early church... Uh, was strongly Jewish in the first century. And so even though they rejected about 30% of the early uh, of the Jews in the first century accepted Christ as their Messiah. So it got off to a fairly good start, I would say, compared to uh, other times. And so he says that, that when he does this, when he circumcises their heart, when he gives them a new heart, then they will uh, fall in line here. And verse 7 and 8 says, and the Lord your God will inflict on all, all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you. When will this happen? During the tribulation. See, that's the purpose of the tribulation uh, within God's word is to inflict the curses that Israel has experienced. And if you know much about the book of Revelation, I think y'all are in chapter 8 or somewhere now with Andy. Many of these uh, Things, especially when you get past the first five uh, uh, seal judgments, are similar to the curses that you find in Egypt. The uh, ten curses, or the uh, curses that God sent to the Egyptians, etc. 
They're not all the similar, but here you have a global implementation of these judgments by God on what are called the earth dwellers. That phrase earth dweller is used 11 times in the book of Revelation to describe the unbelievers in the tribulation. And it says that only earth dwellers take the mark of the beast. And not one earth dweller, it says, uh, will be saved. And it says in the last two references, I think chapter 14 and 17, it says because their names were not found written in the book of life from the foundation of the earth. Not one earth dweller is saved. The phrase heaven dweller is used twice in the book of Revelation to refer to believers. Those whose focus is on heaven, on God's will coming down from heaven versus those whose focus is only on the earth. And so he'll inflict all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who persecuted you. And you shall again obey the Lord and observe all his commandments, which I command you today. And so Israel is going to be converted in the future and, uh, because God is going to see to it. And the tribulation period, which the church is not destined for, is going to be removed so that God is working through Israel. You have the two witnesses that are going to evangelize the Jewish people in Jerusalem. You have the 144,000 Jewish evangelists who will be evangelizing the entire world. You have the angelic evangelization of angels as Revelation 14 talks about. Every person on planet earth will have heard the gospel during the tribulation. The go this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the entire world for a witness and then the end shall come. That's talking about the tribulation, not the church age. Although the gospel has pretty much been preached all around the world uh, today. And then we see in verse 30, chapter 30, verse 9, it says, Then the Lord your God will prosper you abundantly in all the work of your hands. So this is the millennium. In the offspring of your body, in the offspring of your cattle, and in the produce of your ground. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good, just as he rejoiced over your fathers. So God... Like the book of Job, remember how it ends? After Job is tested and goes through all this, then he receives twice the blessing at the end than he, did at the, than he had at the beginning. And so, so it is with God's people, the Jewish people. They will receive even greater blessing at the end. And hey, us Gentiles, we'll be there. We're the bride of Christ. We'll be there. We'll have a great time and a tremendous place as well through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so he's going to uh, rejoice over you for good, just as he rejoiced over your fathers. Verse 10 says, if you obey the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And that's the problem, they didn't. <laughs> you and I cannot do it either apart from the grace of God as well. And so we see in verse 19 at the end of this section, he says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today. And once again, he has angelic witnesses who viewed the signing of this covenant, the making of this covenant. At the end of Deuteronomy, the people say, yes, we'll do it. We'll do it. Yeah, man, we're going to keep this, right? As we've talked about. That I have set before you life and death the blessing and the curse, so choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. And, you know, there have always been individuals throughout the nation of Israel, you know, that are uh, believers that keep and serve the Lord. But the nation as a whole is what he's talking about here. They're going to be converted by the end of the seven-year tribulation. I probably know at least three or four dozen Jewish believers myself today. I'm sure some of y'all know Jewish believers as well. So as I say, they're part of the church. And so this is suspended for them because the nation is temporarily set aside while he deals with the church. And then he's going to uh, deal with them during the tribulation. Verse 20 says, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice, and by holding fast to him. For this is your life, and the length of your days, 
that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to give them. And so we've pointed out the land was given to Israel in an unconditional covenant. But the Mosaic law, as we're seeing here, is the conditions for them enjoying the land and being in the land and prospering. And this is what they have failed to do. And so history demonstrates that no matter who we are, Jew or Gentile, we all need the grace of God, don't we? None of us can obey and do what God wants us to do in our own strength and, and power. If, if God's grace had not been available, you would not have, have accepted Christ. I would not have accepted Christ even today. And so it is with Israel. And so he's going to do this. And so we see the flow of God's plan. And it's talked about in the New Testament. There are four major passages in the New Testament that talk about how the church age is a mystery that was hidden in previous ages. It, once again, it's not God switching from plan A to plan B. God never has plan Bs. He doesn't need them. He only has plan As. And it's not that God can't do what he's doing. It's that he chose to have a multifaceted plan. Just like you read a novel, for example, that has multiple plots. God can have Israel. God can have the church, you see. And what does he do? He, the good novelist ties them all together in the end, right? Of the story. We see this all the time on TV programs and stuff. And we don't think that's weird. But some people think it's weird for God to be dealing with different people groups in certain ways, you see. Well, it's not. He's a good novelist, but it's a real history here, you know historical novel uh, and the fact of the matter is is this is exactly what he's talking about in Ephesians chapter 3 in Romans 16 in Colossians 1 and 2 and in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 4 it talks about this plan that was kept secret and here's part of what he talked about here in Ephesians to, that during this age the purpose is to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. That's us. The tremendous riches that are available in Christ. And to bring to light what is the dispensation of the mystery. In other words, the church age. Paul says that he was given part of his purpose as the apostle to the Gentiles is to unveil the, the mystery of the dispensation of the church age. And so he says the mystery, and mystery here doesn't mean mysterious or hard to understand or whodunit or any of that. It may, simply means a hidden part, a secret part is, is the better idea here. To bring to light what is the dispensation, and a dispensation, as Dr. Ryrie used to say, is a distinguishable economy in the outworking of God's master plan. In other words, it's a phase. And so the purpose of this age or dispensation, uh, for example, in the presidency, we have different presidents and each one has a dispensation or administration. You see, it changes from president to president even though there's certain continuity uh, to each president. Uh, there's less continuity among some presidents than others, but nevertheless, uh, the mystery which for ages had been hidden in God. See, it says that it wasn't revealed in the Old Testament. So none of what the Old Testament talks about talks about Israel, for example, uh, in the eternal state. It talks about Israel in the millennium, but none of that directly includes the church age, you see, that, that they're talking about. Uh, had been hidden in God who created all things in order that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church. And this phrase, manifold wisdom, is what we call uh, in academia a hopox legomena. That means, that's a Greek phrase meaning only used once in the New Testament, for example. And it's a, so it's a unique phrase. And many manifold wisdom of God is the idea of a single plan that has different sides or dimensions to it, you see? So here he tells us idealistically that his plan has multiple phases to it, you see? So it's like a diamond 
that's a single entity, but it has different cuts and things to it that you turn it around and look at the different aspects or hues that it may have. And so God's plan uh, for the church is part of his many-sided wisdom. And he's now making it known through the church. So the church is his instrument. Jew and Gen- saved Jews and saved Gentiles are the church age. And we, our purpose is evangelization and building up the saints. That's the purpose of the church. And this was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Jesus Christ. And so, it's like this. God's plan for Israel was laid out. And the Old Testament reveals it along that way. And then the entire plan, even the future aspects, are included for Israel. But then he drops in a whole phase that wasn't talked about. And that is the church age. And that's carried out in the New Testament. And so when you read Deuteronomy and these other things, it doesn't have anything about the church. It just talks about God's plan for Israel. And so that's why you have the rapture of the church is taken out so that God can finish his plan for Israel. And you have a return uh, after the 69 weeks of years. It says the Messiah in Daniel 9, 24 through 27 will be cut off and have nothing. None of the six purposes of Daniel 9, 24 uh, will be fulfilled. And so here you are on the verge. You know, have you ever noticed how God does everything at the last minute? All the time. And, uh, you know, Sarah, she's in her 90s, and he finally fulfills the promise to her. I mean, who has a baby at age 90? Nobody, except Sarah. And you see the same thing. Uh, Women that aren't able to have children and God, they pray to God and he gives them a special child who's part of his plan at the last minute. See, he rejects the first, accepts the second. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, etc. And those kinds of things. And so God is going to fulfill all six of the purposes of the 70th week of Daniel, 70 weeks of Daniel at the, during the last week known as the tribulation period, where he is going to redeem Israel, as we have seen. And so, God's plan for Israel provides a prophetic roadmap for history. Did you realize that? The church age, the 2,000 years so far, has been the longest phase in which the gospel is being taken to the entire world. But, he's, he's going to then move the different nations and people into the right place at the right time, and he's going to rapture the church. Could happen today. Wouldn't that be nice? Right before the Super Bowl. (laughs) And I believe some of the players would be missing. (laughs) But many would be left behind. Uh, In fact, I think last year's Super Bowl winner quarterback would have been gone from what I hear Uh, but I'm pretty sure Tom Brady would be left behind but nevertheless (laughs) I I shouldn't speak that way I don't know anything about their personal lives but but nevertheless God is going to interrupt this suddenly and unexpectedly and everybody's going to freak out right Space Brothers came and took them you know or something like that you know Uh, So, we see that Israel has two end-time regatherings that are spoken of in the Bible. And the first end-time regathering is before the tribulation and unbelief. Uh, This is end-time regatherings from the nations. So, their return from the 586 B.C. was not from the nations. It was only 50,000 that returned from a nation, Babylon. But it talks about two end-time regatherings from around the nations. So I believe we're seeing in process, it's not fulfilled yet, before the tribulation, in preparation for uh, the events of the tribulation, Israel is being returned from the nations. What is it, something like 148 nations that the modern Jews have come back from today? 
Um, Arnold Furchtenbaum tells a joke about how there are Jews on every continent. And they say, well, what about Antarctica? And you know, they say, well, haven't you heard of the icebergs? Or something, <laughs> like that. You know, or something like that. Uh, but they're returning from all over the world and they have become a great high-tech center and all of this kind of stuff. You, after all, you have all these Jewish people there who are pretty smart folks as a whole. And how they even dominate when they're given an opportunity the Gentile world uh, in, in a lot of areas. And so this is going on. They've been there 70 years and he's, he's preparing them, he's preparing the nations. And so what are we seeing? We're seeing a world increase, increasingly that hates Israel. And uh, we're seeing in our own country how uh, Israel hatred is part of a particular party that used to love Israel. And it, we're seeing a total shift in the United States. And if you want to bring the judgment of God down on you as a Gentile, then become anti-Semitic. And that will happen, uh, both individually and corporately as a nation. And so God, uh, we're seeing that. So when the rapture occurs in this country, we're already set up ideologically uh, for this global government. You know, and everybody talks about how the only solution to the world's problems is global government today, right? We just need to not have boundaries or borders and just have everybody be part of one single thing. Well, that's, it's going to happen. And uh, that, along with Israel being gathered uh, back to the land. By the way, um, when Israel became a nation back in 1948, it was estimated that there were like six Jewish Christians in the land. Six. Not many. Today, they estimate about 35,000 Jewish believers in Israel that love the Lord. And increasingly, there are Arabs that are coming to know Christ as their Savior as well. So you have the events of the seven-year tribulation, which is supposed to prepare the, na the world and the nation for the second coming. And then you have him returning. And the second coming is a rescue event. That's the purpose or the logic of the second coming. It's to rescue Israel. Because as the Olivet Discourse says, if Christ had let, let this go on, then no flesh, talking about Israel here, would be saved. In other words, they would be wiped out. So he's going to come at, after seven years of the tribulation to rescue Israel and uh, redeem his people. And as I've said, two-thirds of the Jews will have been wiped out during this period. But I've been criticized by people who disagree with their views, saying, oh, Tommy Heiss says that uh, two-thirds two of Jews are going to be killed. So, you know, if the Jews go back to Israel, then, uh, you know, two-thirds of you, two out of three, you're going to be killed. Well, all unbelievers at the second coming are going to be killed. So, how come they don't talk about that? Uh, no, at the second coming, Christ purges out all unbelievers out of the planet. So the only solution is become a believer, right? Uh, after the rapture, but if you're a believer before the rapture, you'll be taken up at the rapture. So that's the point. And this is basically God's plan. Then when he returns, he sets up, well, he has a 75-day interval to clean up the mess. How long would it take the EPA? <laughs> First, they would have to argue about it. Then they would have to pass a bill. And then it would take... A long time and, and all of our tax money to clean up the, uh, and I like to call the tribulation the day God trashes the planet. <laughs> makes, makes the environmentalists really mad. But nevertheless, he's going to clean it up. It's his planet. And it's going to be millennial conditions after the 75-day interval for a thousand years. We're, uh, we as the bride are married during the tribulation period, we experience the beam of judgment where Christ is going to evaluate how faithful we have been during this time. 
And the marriage takes place, according to Revelation 19, right before the second coming. And then the marriage supper of the Lamb takes place in, at the beginning of the millennium, where the guests, from, the redeemed from all history, will come together to celebrate the marriage of the Lamb during the beginning of the millennium. Isn't that going to be great? See, it's not going to be just hanging out in clouds <laughs> with a harp. It's going to be just as physical as it is today uh, for all eternity. We're going to have a new body, et cetera, and all of that. And we're even going to have parties. Isn't that great? Uh, in the future. And so after the thousand years, then Satan is released. And he leads a rebellion of, of the secret unbelievers. So it's the opposite of today. Christians are often secret service Christians. But the unbelievers will be the secret service folks. And Satan will somehow uh, get them out and they will attack the city of Jerusalem and God will wipe them out. Instead of taking seven years, he's going to just <laughs> bolt of lightning is going to blow them away. And then we go into the eternal state for all eternity. Transitioned into it by the great white throne judgment where every unbeliever uh, gets an opportunity to present their case and it says they're not going to have the dream team to support them here at the judgment. It's just going to be them and everybody's going to uh, says not have a word to say. They'll know they're guilty and they will spend eternity in the lake of fire and that's absolutely true. Uh, the lake of fire is what we popularly know as hell. And so we will spend eternity, the redeemed, with, first of all, the thousand-year millennium and then the eternal state, where the new heavens and new earth are, just, are brought down. The current heavens and earth are going to be destroyed because sin taints this current universe. And then we will be uh, <clears throat> redeemed and have a totally new heaven and new earth. So that is God's plan for history. And with that, I'm out of here. So, <laughs> and I just want to make sure that if you don't know Christ as your Savior today, that you need to make sure that you have trusted in Him to pay for your sins. And that's why Christ came to planet Earth, to die on the cross for our sins. And you can trust Christ today if you haven't ever done that in order to receive the forgiveness. And those of us that are believers, uh, before we're out of here, we're to serve him sacrificially till he takes us to be with him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the grace of God and for, the, for your amazing plan for history and how you prophesied it before it ever happened and how you're still working with your people Israel. And we thank you so much that you include us as Gentile believers during the church age and that you've given us a tremendous status as your bride and we pray that we would be faithful as we serve you in the days ahead as we are most that we only have a few years here on planet earth but eternity to spend with you and we just thank you for the tremendous blessings and we pray in Christ's name